Hi teachers, this is Ashley Lennox and welcome to our Bite Size PD today. Today we're going to be talking about building fluency and number sense during the CSD math block. So as we get started, just a quick reflection question here is how does math fact fluency impact how your students solve math problems? And as I was thinking about this question and kind of what were some things that we could do to start this conversation, one of the biggest barriers I saw as a fifth grade teacher was that my students would come and they would have this kind of very basic understanding of their math facts. But when it came to actually applying them to these these very complex math problems that we were asking them to do, oftentimes they weren't able to compute them in a way that was efficient to solve the problem. So jumping into our MTSS framework here, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is in this blue section of evidence-based academic instructional priorities. So how do students actually engage with the learning that we're doing within the classroom? So who am I? I'm Ashley Lennox. I'm your elementary math specialist. I am also elementary social studies. I support on our information literacy team. And if you're a fifth grade teacher, you get a weekly email from me. And I am here to support really with all things fifth grade, but I can support kind of across the board with other things as well. So my email is on there. If you ever have any questions or if you have feedback about this presentation, I'd love to hear from you. So our learning intentions today is that really what we want to do is we want to walk away with an understanding of what math fluency is, how some of the tools that we have in Canyons can support you in, in an effort to increase the number sense that our students are coming into our classrooms with as well as leaving our classrooms with. So you'll know you've got it when you can tell a friend what number sense is and you have a couple of ideas on how you can implement it into your daily instruction. So one thing I want to bring it back to, this is something that um, hopefully you learned about at District Day. This is our early learning growth goal in mathematics. So by the end of this school year, uh, what we are held accountable to from the state is that we are going to increase the percentage of our first grade students who are scoring at or above benchmark on the early math skill of advanced quantity discrimination or AQD on the Acadians math by 4% from beginning of year to end of year. So if you're not a first grade teacher, you're probably wondering, so what, or how does this apply to me? One thing that's important to note is that the AQD was chosen because of its predictability. So, and what I mean by that is that this is a high predictor of students' later mathematical success because it is this idea of do students understand how numbers work, um, especially that base 10 system. So that's really what the AQD is designed to do. And we do see that that AQD has students that are able to do that in first grade are much more likely to be successful in later math measures. Uh, kindergarten teachers, what that means for you is that you have that beginning quantity discrimination, which has a similar predictability as well. So that's kind of where these things come from. Um, if you have heard me present on anything that has to do with fluency or number talks or building fact fluency kit or number sense, you know how I feel about this. And that is that fluency, we've got to start thinking about it as advocacy. I love this quote from the number talks book, the Sherry Parish text. It's directly on page five. So it's so important. It's in the first 10 pages. Um, and we need citizens who are able to discern whether numbers make sense and are applicable to specific situations and who are capable of communicating solutions to problems. And oftentimes, whenever I'm asked to talk about math, it's really hard to pull the math from the real world. Um, when I read this, I want students that can do these things, whether it's because of math or language or um, their civics, all of those things are really intertwined. We want students who can make sense and solve problems, okay, and be able to communicate them effectively. So the next thing that I wanted to make very clear is that when we talk about math fact fluency, math fact fluency is not solving equations quickly. It's not being fast. And this idea is that fluency is the byproduct of flexibility. So this quote from Susan Joe Russell, and this is taking it way back to 2000, is that focusing on fast does not make kids flexible, but focusing on building flexibility 
does make them fast. So, and what we mean by that is that we want students to be able to look at a problem and look at what is the most efficient way for me to solve that. Um, I, I like to joke that as an adult, I've never been asked to solve what three times six is, but I do have to be able to identify where three times six exists in the world that I interact with. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see what that can look like in a classroom through a number talk. It's something that we've been doing in our district for quite a while now. But this idea of number talks is that students were given this equation of 32 plus 48. This is a pretty complex problem for our younger students to accomplish uh, mentally because we do have some regrouping, we have that two digit piece. So um, what you can see here is that students have a series of strategies that they can now pull to solve from. This is not as simple as just giving them the algorithm and moving on. And when I look at each one of these examples, I can think of a context where one version is more efficient than another. So uh, for example, what Connor did was he did that super simple math fact of eight plus 32, knowing that that's 40. Now he has that really easy fact. So he compensated. Um, so now he has 40 plus 40 equals 80. There's a time where students are going to do that. And one of my favorite examples of this that um, I like to show is that when students are given an equation like this, and I know it's going to be backwards, but 13 minus 9. Um, when students know the equation, what they're going to do is they are, or the algorithm, pardon me, is they are going to regroup, right? So they're going to regroup from that tens place, make that a zero, and the three, wait a minute, is still 13. So if we just focus on teaching the algorithm, that's the type of mathematician that we're going to get from our classroom, and that's not a mathematician that can solve complex problems. Next, I just wanted to touch on this brain imaging as well. This is from this is a study from 2012, and researchers discovered that students who felt panicky during math had increased activity in the brain regions associated with fear and decreased activity in the regions associated with problem solving. And when I think of what I want a math classroom to look like for my own child or for all of our students with the Canyon School District, or where I felt the most successful, this idea that they aren't able to problem solve or they're afraid um, is kind of the opposite of what we want. And I think I would be remiss if we didn't discuss kind of what we're seeing right now. And a lot of the feedback that I get from teachers is that they feel like there are still so many extreme behaviors that are occurring within the classroom that if we can't support students in that math instruction, we are going to continue to see that explosive behavior. So we've got to find some ways to support students throughout their learning in order to kind of pull back from some of these things that we're seeing. Okay, so what is number sense? Um, this is kind of the million dollar question, right? Um, so I, I love kind of how this is broken down. So good number sense is the whole purpose is to help children manipulate numbers. It helps them to make those calculations easier and it gives them the confidence to be flexible in their approach to problem solving. So that's kind of the opposite of what we saw in some of those previous slides. Um, students who develop that number sense can assess how reasonable an answer is, and they routinely estimate answers before calculating. Oftentimes when I go into classrooms, students will come up with kind of these these bonkers answers to these math equations. And it's difficult as a teacher to kind of identify where students went wrong because they don't have that ability to see if their answer is reasonable. Um, they look for connections. They readily spot patterns in numbers, which can help them predict future outcomes. They have several approaches to calculating and problem solving, and they use and adapt these for new situations. So when we think about what math looks like when students get to some of those summative assessments and really just math in the real world, we have to be able to go at things from different situations. Um, there, there's not one way to do these things that students are asked to do when they apply math. Okay. Um, children with good number sense, they enjoy playing with and exploring numbers and number relationships. So, and as a result of these strategies, they can often find the most efficient solution to the problem. So that example of 13 minus nine, where the students are regrouping instead of just counting up, for example, um, that's where we can see how that number sense, we want to develop that within our students, because that's a much more efficient way of getting to our answer. So what does it look like when a student doesn't have it? And this is probably going to describe some of the students in your classroom that um, 
you, you know, may present even as good mathematicians. So children with poor number sense tend to focus on procedure, right? They have that, that rote procedure memorized and they will rely on the methods that they feel secure with. They can't think that they don't have the skills yet, I should say it that way, to think outside of that algorithmic piece. They have the one way that they do things. Um, they will apply inefficient and immature strategies to calculations and fail to spot links and connections that could get them to the answer more quickly. So one example that I can think of is um, I had a student who was actually a, a fairly confident mathematician. And again, this was fifth grade. And when he would divide, he always drew a picture of it and then would circle those groups. He didn't have the skills to think outside of the picture. So again, he presented as a good mathematician. His comp and his cap scores were relatively high. He did well on those envision topic assessments. But at the end of the day, he wasn't able to see where those connections were and look at a more efficient way. He learned one way and that was it. And there, there, it was really difficult to change that. They can quickly become frustrated with math concepts and they struggle to estimate effectively. So this is adapted from the work of Judy Hornigold, and she has some really great works out there um, that teachers can use, and she also has some really wonderful resources as well. So how do we build number sense? Um, so we know what it looks like, we know what it doesn't look like, what can we do in our classrooms? So number sense develops over time, and it, it does so through these opportunities to explore and really to play with numbers. So visualizing numbers in different contexts, spotting relationships between numbers, and predicting the patterns are all ways that we can support students in building that number sense. So on the right-hand side, these are some examples of what number sense can look like in terms of like a, an SBI, or I'm sorry, like a center group or a center station that students can go to. It's not something, these ones over here, that I would recommend having a lot of teacher direction with outside of when you're introducing the concept. But for example, that first picture is students are quite simply looking at the number that's on the playing card. Those look like probably some leftover ones from maybe like a, a DI or savers run and then attaching that number of closed pins to it. The one in the right hand side is students are given a piece of paper with just dots on it and they're asked to do the numbers 1 to 12 or 1 to 15 and they have to visualize how they can find those groups in an efficient manner. On the bottom left, that's an example of students supatizing where they have their dot cards and then they have to identify the digit that represents the dot card. This is super helpful for students that are trying to build their skills on the beginning quantity discrimination. And then on the right hand side, that's quite simply sequencing with Legos. So, um, you know, when you can get those cheap Lego sets or those mega block sets, um, again, that savers and DI run, um, you know, put numbers on them and have students just quite simply put them in order. This is quite simple rote counting of one, two, three, four, but an extension of that could be that you could do different patterns of numbers. So if you're doing a lesson string with twos, it's two, four, six, eight, or have students have all of the numbers there and they have to identify what would the next one be in the sequence, which is very similar to our missing number or next number of fluency. Okay, so where is it in the math block? We value this, we know that it's important. And as you know, the Canyons math team, what we've done is we've built it into your day for you. So this is something that should be present for every student every day during that math block. So kindergarten, I want to acknowledge that a lot of what you're doing is building number sense. Most of your day during that 75 minute math block is dedicated to number sense. But where can we put it guaranteed every day for a quick hit of things is in that review block of time. First through fifth grade, you have a dedicated 10 to 15 minutes of building number sense. When we're talking about that whole group explicit instruction piece of number sense, what we recommend is that number talks book or the building fact fluency kits. I think it's important to note that the building fact fluency kits have number talks built into each lesson string for you and support students in going through that concrete representational abstract continuum. Um, it's also, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but this idea of what is one routine that we can use with those different materials. And that's really kind of what the building fact fluency kit is meant to do. So building fact fluency is instruction helps our students to develop deep conceptual understanding and procedural fluency at the same time. So what do the numbers mean? How do they work? And how do they work together is really how I would describe that in a simple way. 
Your kit itself has all of the hard materials to help students develop the number sense. So those are things like your cards, um, game boards, your counters, your dice, etc., are going to be housed in there. And then your online platform holds videos, um, printable opportunities, and then all of the images as well. And then you also have a very explicit scope and sequence. So everything is kind of done for you. And then you can kind of ebb and flow as you need to. So here's what that looks like. So on the right, sorry, on the left hand side over here, we have that addition and subtraction, what that looks like on the right hand side, multiplication and division. What's important that I want you to kind of walk away knowing is that once you get your kit, most of your online or most of your materials are going to be found online. And that's really where you're going to be doing a lot of your living outside of the manipulatives for students. Okay. So I wanted to share this information. This is from a teacher who implemented the Building Fact Fluency Kit early on at the beginning of last year. And this is what her growth looks like over time. So I think right off the bat, we can see how effective her math instruction truly was and Building Fact Fluency Kits were one component of, of good instruction. Whenever I share data, I think it's really important that we look at not just the percents, but our end size, because those end size are humans. Those are those are the kiddos in our classroom that are depending on us to support them in getting to that next step. And when I look at this teacher's beginning of the year data on the math composite or the math computation, really all of them, but those two specifically, her end size of seven, of meaning seven students that were below benchmark, um, seven students is a big small group right that's not really a small group anymore so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're putting in those supports right away to support students because realistically intervening with that high number of students every day is is a heavy lift for our teachers to do so when I talked to this teacher about what she felt like this data could be attributed to, some of the things that she said were that the Building Fact Fluency Kit, I, I feel like it's only 10 minutes a day, um, she felt like it changed the way that she was talking about numbers, as well as how her students were talking about numbers and thinking about numbers. She also felt like it gave her, her math block a better flow of how things could look, so it wasn't as, in, in her words, kind of clunky going through. So kind of gave the students some movement already built in. So that's one data point. I think that there's a lot to be said for all of the data that we have in Canyon School District. So looking at that holistic view, the next one is her pathways of progress. And quite simply, were students growing? Were the students that came in at or above benchmark growing in that trajectory as well? And the answer was a resounding yes. So every single student in her classroom was on pathway three, four, or five. So every single student was meeting that state goal with a large majority of them being in that pathway five, which I thought was pretty impressive. And third through fifth grade teachers, I think you'll appreciate this data with the rise, but with the rise specifically, what we found was that stu these students were thinking very deeply about math numbers and math concepts. So 92% of her fourth grade students were on benchmark for rise with 50% of them at that level four. Um, no students were at that level one and two students were at a level two. So two students left unable to meet those benchmarks. Um, some of the questions that have come up when I've shown teachers this data are, you know, did she have any students with IEPs or any type of special populations? And the answer is yes. Um, so this 10 minutes a day really kind of helped shape the way the students were thinking about numbers and building that number sense. So a lesson string is a cluster of related activities, tasks, and games for each contact. So over the course of a lesson string, students are able to discuss vibrant images using mathematical language as they mathematize, it's my new favorite word, um, real world situations. So what you can see here is what that lesson string can potentially look like and how it can be shown to students. So in this example, we start with that five plus five, so our doubles. We move on to a five plus seven. And then by the end, you can see that we're actually switching it. So we're not doing five plus anymore. Now it's eight plus five instead of five plus eight. So within the Building Fact Fluency kits, the components of each lesson string are listed here. One thing I wanted to point out to you is that these first three, the image talk, tool talk, and number talk, those are all the same routine using different materials um, or different realia, if you will. And then from there, you can see that there's a number of things that teachers can use within their instruction. Again, 
10 minutes a day. Um, I would encourage you that as you get used to the flow of these lessons and whether you're doing a number talk or building fact fluency or something different, um, as you're building that number sense into your classroom, set that 10 minute timer because after 10 minutes, you will start to see the kiddos drift. So this is what it looks like. Um, if you've been in Canyons for a while, you've probably heard us talk about the CRA framework or the concrete representational abstract. So we start with an image talk, which is very concrete for students. Um, it, it's two bikes, right? It's right there. We're not trying to get, figure out what two means. It's, it's very concrete and kind of that built in manipulative piece. Right. And as students go through the images, they're asked to anticipate what's coming next. They're asked to kind of look at how can we turn this into a math equation. So there's lots of opportunities here for students to really think through what what those two bikes or now four bikes means. Now, when you first do this, you are going to get answers like the next bikes are going to be green. That's OK. Right. We're going to validate all of the answers that are given. And then we just ask them to bring it back. Um, you know, OK, you're right. We might have different color bikes next time. Can we turn that into a math equation? Okay, so we can see what that looks like. And then we move. So that's day one, right? Our first day is just going to be that image talk. So that's 10 minutes. Lots of turn and talks, lots of time for the students to, to talk things out. Um, the other thing that's nice about this is that during that 10 minute block of time as the teacher, you're really only leading for about one minute out of the 10. A lot of this is student talk. Then we move on to the tool talk piece. And this is where we're moving into that representational aspect of math instruction. And we're using tools, manipulatives that you probably have in your classroom through images, right? So the images are provided for you. What I love about this one and just using this one as an example is that students can see that the product of two times three and three times two is the same, but that two times three means something than three times two. So right here, we have two dice with three dots on them each. There's six dots total. Um, over here, we have three dice with two dots on them. That also has six dots total, but this means different things, right? So that's that number sense piece kind of in action. And we can see the same thing here with that four and two and two and four. The, so that's our next day. Our third day of instruction goes into the number talks, which is that very abstract, um, you know, called naked numbers, right? Students don't know what two times one means until we give them that context, like with that first lesson string with the bikes, right? That first image that we saw was two times one. Um, so what we're doing is we're now connecting those equations to something for students. And again, that's how we build that number sense. Last thing I wanted to talk about was the games. Students absolutely love these games. Um, it, it's a pretty quick explanation of how to play the games, and then they're able to do them on their own. And it's each game uh, kind of emerges with different lesson strings. I even just saw a teacher or, or two teachers because they're on a team during the parent teacher conferences. They had these games out in the hallway for parents or families to use with their student while they were waiting for their turn. So they were sitting out there and the note just said, hey, while well, you're waiting for us to finish up with the previous conference time, feel free to play a game with your student. They know the rules. They can explain it to you. And it was really fun to watch the families engaging in that math together. So if this is something that you're interested in, we do have the Canvas course. And the way that it's set up is that for each element, you're going to read about it a little bit. You're going to watch a little of it in action with the, the writers or the authors of the Building Fact Fluency Kit, and then you're going to try it with your students. Once you've tried it for a couple of times, you can record your lesson or you can invite me out. And um, then you just kind of get that as a competency checked off is the easiest way to think about that. And then you just write a quick reflection. One thing that we learned is that it's helpful to not record um, on your first time trying this with students because there's a lot of pieces that you're trying to kind of keep straight. And that's just one less thing that you need to worry about. So wait until you have the fluency with the routine. And then once you have that then I'd love to come out and I like to bring treats so how do you access it so this is a link that your coach does have access to we also have the self-enroll link that's housed on the canvas course you just sign up and from there you can earn up to $165 in various stipends and then you can also earn a USB credit 
I wanted to talk very specifically at the end here uh, to my first grade teachers in particular about the AQD, knowing that that's our state goal. A um, couple of ways that you can build number sense and supports the AQD within your classroom in terms of a whole group idea is um, you have your 120s chart, have that at the front of your room. At the beginning of each day, pick two numbers. It doesn't matter which two you choose, circle them and discuss the relationship between them. Have students do those turn and talk. So knowing that 65, is down here and 25 is up here, how do I know which one's greater than or less than, right? Um, and, and looking at things like those tens and ones and, and those various ways that students can compare numbers. Another one is if you attended last week's Bite Size PD with Coach Mare and I, we taught you how to play this or that with two numbers. So what that looks like is you're going to put two numbers on a um, slide deck like this one, and you have two movements. So if you think this number is greater, you can do the hand jive. If you think that number is greater, you can do your cool thumbs. I don't know, whatever groovy dance moves you want to teach your kiddos. Um, this is helpful. I, I, I'm going to say with all numbers, so K-5, I can find a place for this. But first grade, I know that AQD is something that, that many of you are focusing on. Um, last one that I wanted to point out is have a life-size number line in your classroom. Have a number line on the floor that students can literally skip count on or have students move between two numbers. During um, fall of 2020, when we were trying to figure out how do we socially distance first graders, I saw a lot of you purchased the, um, or had your schools purchase the canvas or the Velcro dots to put on the floor. So you probably have those somewhere. They might still be on your carpet. So if you have those, throw numbers on them, um, you know, and then have students move between the numbers that way as well. So just to come back to our learning intentions and success criteria for today, our goal today was to learn a little bit more about math fluency, a um, little bit more about the Building Fact Fluency Kit. So that way we can start to incorporate that number sense into our daily routines, K-5. So what I hope that you'll do is with that success criteria is um, reach out to a friend, that can be your coach, that can be a teammate, that can be your principal, What's one thing that you'd like to implement daily into your into your number sense routine? And I can't wait to hear some of your responses if you'd like to share them with me. So again, I'm Ashley Lennox. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to me. We are all here for you in the Instructional Supports Department. And um, thank you for all of the hard work that you do with your students. So I hope that you have a great week and thank you for learning with me today.